see it. Two, one. We are now live. Yay. Hi, everybody. I just got a little scared here because my message was server overloaded. Please try again. But we made it. Yay. Yay. <laughs> Welcome to Shameless Facebook Friday Live. Um, I'm Dr. Patty Ashley, and we are talking about shame, which Brene Brown defines as the intensely painful feeling or experience of believing that we're flawed or unworthy of belonging. And I always like to look at the flip side of what would we, what would, what would the experience be if we felt worthy of love and belonging? I think we'd be living our authentic self. So I've been interviewing um, people. I hope you caught Rebecca Folsom last week. It was amazing. Singer, songwriter, voice coach, and incredible human being who's doing some great work in the world. So check that out if you haven't seen it. But today my guest is an art therapist in um, down in New Mexico. And I had the pleasure of meeting her this year at a retreat I was facilitating in Boulder and got to see some of her work and what she's doing. And um, her work as an art therapist and an entrepreneur and a uh, visionary healer combines a lot of the somatic pieces that I write about in my book. So I was really excited to interview our guest today, Val Valentine. <laughs> Hi, Val. Hi, Patty. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, my gosh. I was so glad you could be here. And you've cleared up, too. We were saying before the broadcast, she was all pixely. Um, so now I see you. I can Yay. see you. <laughs> <laughs> so that's good. That's good. This technology is so new for me. And um, oh, then here we are. <laughs> I think you're doing an extraordinary job. Patty, I love watching what you're doing and what you're writing. I've read um, your books and um, just really, really appreciate the work that you're doing in the world. Thank you. Well, I'm glad we've got to meet and have this conversation today. I thought maybe you could just share with our listeners, viewers, a little bit more about who you are and, and your work in the world. And then we'll sure. go from sure. there. I'd be happy to do that. Thank you. Well, this is a second career. Uh, my first career was teaching art, and I just realized that there was a whole lot more going on than I was getting. And I was teaching um, K through six, and they were just really communicating a lot that I didn't know how to hold and I didn't know how to respond to. And so I really got curious and um, went back to school and got my master's degree in art therapy and clinical counseling and um, love this profession. I love uh, what I do. I feel completely honored to have been guided to this um, work in my life. My own personal path has been quite tortured and um, complex and, I, and, and I'm grateful for that because I feel like it, it helps me understand and serve much better. Um, and so I, uh, I've been practicing. I have my own private practice in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And, uh, and I wanted to began a few years ago wanting to be able to reach more people and to be able to offer some of what it took me a lifetime to come to know. And I I think there's some really basic things about emotional well-being and about living well that a lot of us just don't get. We don't get it. We don't get it from our families. We don't get it from our schools. We don't get it from our friends. Like, um, I know I didn't anyway. And I have a pretty good idea I'm not in that boat by myself. <laughs> right. Definitely. Um, Part of my life's work is trying to translate some of the basic knowledge about emotional well being into accessible practices and into something that um, people can learn and do in an easy and a comfortable way and apply to their lives to make their lives better and to make their, um, their relationships better and to move toward what they love instead of away from it. Um, and so I uh, continue to practice as an art therapist and a clinical counselor. And a lot of my energy goes into the emotional well-being box. 
which um, we talked about before we went live. And Patty's agreed to kind of open one online, which I think will be a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, yeah. So like yeah. a little bit about me and where I'm at. Before we get into the box, here's the box, by the way, everybody. So hold on. Everybody has to stay with us to see what's inside the box because I want to know a little bit more about your work as an art therapist and how it relates to shame because, you know, I did write in my book about how I feel creative arts is such a great tool because it actually, um, in my research, can actually create new uh, stillness. Up. Okay. Hopefully we're live. I don't know what just happened there. Yeah. <laughs> I, I see Deb is with us. Hi, Deb. Let us know if we're still here, please. Um, and anybody else, let us know we're here. And uh, let us know you're here in the chat box. Let us know we're here. <laughs> Where are we? <laughs> I'm going to assume we're still here. I can see you, so we'll just do it. <laughs> it's, it's the, the time clock's still clicking, but anyway. Okay. So about art, so hopefully everything's good. Oh, you're back. Okay, yeah. still Hey, Tara. Um, so that's what I love about art therapy is that it is so healing and you don't have to understand why. It does rewire the brain. It rewires our nervous system. It calms us. It heals us. And, and it doesn't, it's not an intellectual process. So some of us, you know, need to know the why and the how and the nervous system and the brain and all of that. And it's very helpful. And some of us don't. So you know? talk to me a little bit about the right left brain, because, you know, I'm really, really um, a firm believer in this right brain psychotherapy. But I know there are people now that the more brain research that's happening, they're saying, oh, that's just not important anymore because the brain does so many other things. But when I look at right brain, left brain, to me, that's a simple way for me to understand the sensory versus the thinking, and the right brain being the sensory. Like you probably read um, A Stroke of Insight. Um, did you read that about the nurse? I haven't read that. I should. She, I she had a stroke. And so here, this left brain I've nerve. Heard of it. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. What are your thoughts on right, left brain in these days and what people are saying and how that relates to your work? What you're saying is like you don't really think about what you're doing, right? You more feel. It's more of a right, feeling. right. Well, a couple of things come up. I think that for me, it, it helps to conceptualize the brain that way for two reasons. One main reason is that it helps me understand what happens in PTSD. So we have an experience and it gets stuck in our right brain. It, it can't get to our left brain where there's time, where there's, this is the past, this is the future, where there's language, where there is recognition of what happened. Something happens and from then on, the way the light comes in the window can trigger us and we don't even know why we're being triggered. Mm -hmm. So if we um, work with that, we can move those things that get stuck in sensory areas and move them over into this happened at this time, that was the past, this is the future, this, I mean, this is the present, and I can then have a different future as I work with that. So if we're, we have um, something called the instinctual trauma response in art therapy, which is beautiful um, way of processing trauma and recognizing what happened in trauma without re-traumatizing. And it's, you know, nine drawings that you do in a safe container with someone who can guide you through it. And they're stick figures, like it's not, this is not art. And that's what I have to really get through. Like you were asking about the shame around what happens when people have a resistance to doing art. Yeah. And what I um, like to um, say to them is that if you tell a story using fi stick figures, but you're drawing that story out and it holds a, a storyline for you, that's art therapy. If you create an art, a piece of art and it is god awful to look at, like it is terrible, <laughs> it, it 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 evokes this like um, feeling of just uh, disgust. 
that's art therapy. If you create something that that is true to you, that speaks the truth, no matter what it looks like, that's art therapy. And it's about expressing your truth and expressing it in a non-verbal way. So we bypass the left brain and we go into the right brain and all kinds of things get exposed. The subconscious gets exposed. Connections get made on a piece of paper that you could never make when you're just speaking words out into the ether and trying to hold on to them and trying to hold on to the concepts. But when you create a piece of art, then you've got something that can reflect back to you that can yeah. hold the emotion. It gets out of you. So there's so many different layers of healing in that process that is extraordinary and, mm -hmm. and self-driven. That's what I really um, appreciate about our therapy is that it is authentic. It's an, a way of really communicating in an authentic way with yourself. Mm -hmm. So it's not me trying to tell a client about all the theory that I've learned in my career. It's them having a personal experience with themselves and healing something in, within themselves, which to me is the goal. You know, mm -hmm. the goal is that the client is able to um, really heal something in themselves. Mm -hmm. And they don't have to understand how it happens. You know, we yeah. don't have to nail it down to, okay, we moved this memory of this light from an area of your brain that didn't have any way of recognizing that it was happening, that the trauma happened in the past. So it, it saw the light as alert, something horrible is about to happen. And, and then your frontal lobe goes offline and you go into you know survival mode mm -hmm. and i don't have to explain all of that to someone you know i can say yeah. you know let's do this process and mm -hmm. see what happens and then be guided by what happens within them and the truths that come out of them and what they can make of their lives and um i mean that to me is so exciting and then when you add the awareness of what you bring in your book. I have it right here. Thank oh. you. Oh, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> um, to me, this feels very avant-garde. It feels like the next step in really understanding healing. So mm -hmm. in the past few years, the big catch word is trauma-informed. Every therapy needs to be trauma-informed. We need to understand what's happening, what the trauma did in the body, what what, how it's stored, we now know through work of incredible people that it is stored in the body and mm -hmm. it's stored in our brains in different places that we may not have access to. And how do we heal that? How do we heal our nervous system? It's not about sitting in an office restating the trauma. It's right. about how do we move our bodies? How do we learn how to comfort ourselves? How do we learn how to, to use tools to heal our nervous systems, to heal our, um, our spleen. So I just had a question that popped in. I love all that. And the thing that I love is, um, yeah, the trauma-informed care. The thing about shame is it's often our shame is more implicit, whereas a trauma may be more explicit. So we know the event that happened sometimes, sometimes not. And they usually go hand in hand. But my work with shame is had evolved over time of this feeling of not being worthy of love and belonging that I saw in just about every client, if I could probably right. say every client. Yeah. Um, and I was like, whoa, but they don't, they're like, but nothing really bad happened to me. You know, I wasn't sexually abused, right. <laughs> but you know, there was, I believe the shame in the old parenting belief systems of stop crying before I give you something to cry about. What's your problem? Get over it, all that stuff. But anyway, we'll go into that. But what I was going to say is, which is uh, 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 my ADHD brain here, <laughs> my shameless ADHD. Um, the question that just popped into my mind when you were talking about your work was this work that we're doing virtually now. So how does that affect art therapy are you are you mostly it affects art therapy big time like i don't like it i can't yeah i mean i can do clinical counseling i'm trained to do counseling um 
but I have had to reorient. What, this is the only way I know how to describe it. My receivers. Yeah. So I recognize that when I'm in a room with someone, I'm picking up body language, I'm picking up energy, I'm picking up small little movements on the face and the breath. And I'm not, I, I don't have to right. concentrate to pick those things up. But changing that to a screen like we're on right now, where all you see is the top part of the face or the body, you see the face, you may be able to catch a breath. You, you know, I can see things, but I'm, I had to reorient what I'm receiving and the information I'm receiving from a client. And it's exhausting for me. Like I don't, it, it's like getting half the information and trying to translate that into my understanding of what's happening with someone and and my response to someone and it's and i don't have my materials and i don't have my studio and you know some people have paper and pens and markers at home um, so that's what we're using some people have kids so they have a little bit more but it's for me it, it it's really like try like a huge handicap it's like you know I will lose. The, the profession has lost. But I have to say, I've opened my studio back up. Like mm -hmm. I, uh, you know, everybody washes their hands before, uses, you know, the sanitizer and comes in. And, and I'm careful that materials that come out stay on the table. I clean them up, like, because I, I can't do art therapy through yeah. the screen. Now, that doesn't mean I can't empathize and I can't support and I can't be present, which people need right now. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, yeah, I, it is hard. And I, anyway, uh, <laughs> we're doing it though. I'm glad that, yeah. you know, I still stay connected to my clients. And, um, and I oftentimes, if a client does like art, I might suggest a homework activity. And uh, it's amazing the amount of artists that are coming out of the closet that I'm working with, you know, and they, especially the teens, you know, and they show, I said, well, let me see. And I go, oh my yeah. God. Of course they think it's horrible, right? And I'm like, mm, I could never detail a cat face like right. that or whatever. Yeah. And, but to give them that opportunity, you know, cause there's so much stress and anxiety, you know, as an exercise in between sessions. So, you know, um, I found that really helpful. And again, people who aren't really resistant to art, but there still are these, there's this perfectionism, which is a big defense against shame, especially the people that are I good at art. A big cause of shame. Mm -hmm. Perfectionism to me is a cause of shame. When we, you know, it feeds it, it amplifies it. It's like, I have to do, I have to do it this certain way or I can't do it. I'm not going to do it if it doesn't look this way. What? Yeah. Something that shuts you down that extreme. Yeah. Is just the fear of being flawed, of being flawed. seen as flawed, and it's it's. I work with a lot of young girls, particularly college, you know, high school, college, and they, their anxiety is off the yeah. charts. This hurts my heart. I know, and there's been so many suicides in the high schools here because one of the high schools in Boulder is really overachieving school. So the, the expectations for these kiddos. So one year there were like three or four suicides mm -hmm. and they were all the overachievers. And so yeah, yeah, big shout out to perfectionism people. I think like Jeremy Taylor would say, perfect is the opposite of finished. You know, we do the best we can. And I was telling Val before we came on when I paint, I, pretend I'm in kindergarten and that way I don't have to worry about if it's gallery worthy, which it's no, not. it's whatever my art and say it isn't, but <laughs> it's just fun. It gives me an opportunity to the whole world goes away. My experience of art started with mandalas, like almost 30 years ago, Paul Hosenstam from California was a mandala artist came to the, um, the art center in Virginia beach. And I don't know why I was just, called to mandalas when I was curious. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of curiosity, which could, you know, the curiosity kills the cat, but luckily mm -hmm. it's not a fact it back. So it leads me lots of places, my curiosity, and it led me to this workshop. And I hadn't really done any art because it was like, oh, I can't do that. But his process, he um, uses, well, in that workshop, he 
probably does it different now, but use use stencils. And so there was some yeah, sort I've of done that. I have to, the to the mandala. And so we do a guided meditation. We get images from the meditation. We find stencils and we put them around in eight um, sections of the mandala. And I was able then to relax and go, oh, and then I start coloring and man, I'm off and I'm gone. And I was going through a divorce at the time and it really got me through a lot of the anxiety of the divorce. And so now 20, some 30, 20, 30 years later, um, you know, I'm painting mandalas and my, and I just love, you can get the square canvas now at Michael's, even black. Cause I like to paint on black as a way of the unconscious, but anyway, Oh, that's been my experience of art through the years. And now I'm so grateful for that. And so all my clients that like to do art, I encourage them to as well. And I can hear, you know, how it would be really different. I don't do a lot of art in session with, with my clients because I'm not a, you know, trained art therapist, but I certainly do um, move people in the direction of some sort of sensory experiences, which, um, you know, as you were saying, we know now that trauma and shame live in the body memory. And so my book, I try and give a lot of suggestions for like, find what people are interested in. If it's not art, maybe it's dance, maybe it's music, maybe it's, um, and, and how do we get into our senses? So that was my lead up, long lead up. Sorry, I didn't mean to talk so much about mandalas, but no, I, I, I great. when you brought that mandala to Lee, um, we were working with the medicine wheel and I planned to, you know, invite people to do a mandala and she yeah, showed up with this gorgeous medicine wheel mandala, um, and on the square campus. And, um, it was just, yay. Uh, so mandalas to me are just such a great way to connect with these unconscious pieces. Well, and um, Madonna, I'd like, just like to add the lineage of the mandala. The mandala was comes from cultures all over the world and very often are created in harmony and in the presence of something larger than self. They are often called prayers. Like they're done with a reverence and with an intention that is that adds to it and the the length the lineage of them i think adds to their power they're incredibly powerful way to heal ourselves and then to put our own symbols and to make our own connections and to look at you know even um the one that i did for lee was had all of the directions and all of the you know uh developmental stages of the human being and all of the growing seasons and um the seasons and and so when we connect to those bigger metaphors and those bigger um, archetypes, it empowers, it heals, it helps us get out of um, our pain and connect us to something bigger. And I think that that's a thread that runs through all of art therapy and all of therapy too. Mm -hmm. And the circle to me, I think of it as like a telescope into the soul, you know, into our essence, yeah. because it brings up archetypal images, very much like dream work, because I also love to do dream work mm -hmm. um, as a way to access the unconscious and these, these, these sensory memories that maybe don't even have mm -hmm. language. So they archetypes actually rewire the right brain too. And that's what it is. It's archetypal meaning. I don't know. Uh, can you define archetype for us? Because I always mess it up. I'm putting you on the spot here. Yeah, it's a hard concept, but I, I always I try to describe it as it's, it's the common experiences that we have as human beings and how we experience um, common um, either people or symbols or times in our lives. So we have the archetype of the good mother. We have the archetype of the bad mother. We have the archetype of the king. We have the archetype of the joker. We have, so there's these clusters of meaning that we all have access to in our unconscious and in our lives that reoccur throughout our lives. And, mm -hmm. um, and so we can study those and get them really deeper and get this much richer understanding. But all of us have connection to them in some way. The archetype of the moon, the archetype of the earth, the archetype of um, 
So it's, it's like a concept, a cluster of ideas that we have around all of these common things that, it, that we experience being human being. Mm -hmm. So it's a sensory experience again. It's a feeling, we feel something when we think of a, a king or a queen or right. a horse yeah. even, you know, like, um, so yeah. So what I do with that is, I mean, that goes back to how I try to work with shame. It's like, what is it that sparks you, that makes you feel connected, that makes you feel good, that you like, the things that you like? And and so many people never try to define this for themselves. It's like this epiphany when they recognize that you, that we all have permission to connect to the things that make us strong, that make us feel good. Because what we do is we have an experience, maybe, and it a difficult experience we have a failure or we have a rejection and the first thing we do is we start pounding ourselves with shame oh i'm so stupid oh i should have never done that oh and so we've been wounded and then we pick up shame to add to that wound mm -hmm. and part of what i'm trying to do with the boxes is create like an emotional hygiene an awareness of what is emotional hygiene what is it to take care of ourselves? And I um, make this comparison of when physical hygiene came online, the human life expectancy increased, doubled. And that was as simple as taking a bath, brushing your teeth, and wound care. Mm -hmm. And that didn't even come into play until like the, 18, the late 1800s. Yeah. That, oh, we should take a bath every day. <laughs> we should clean ourselves. We yeah. should, and life expectancy increased that much yeah so what if we could really bring online emotional hygiene and really understand how to take care of ourselves and how to shut the shame down shut the critic down like no i'm not going there yeah i did my best i learned this i uh, i know my heart i'm a good person i'm trying to and affirm things about us and go toward what we want, yeah. not toward what we don't want. And I it's a that. huge, huge yeah. piece, yeah. I think, of being healthy. That's and what's I so exciting yeah. about your book because there's so many pieces of this that I can pull out for my clients and say, okay, this is where we're getting hung up, you know, the, in the story. Let's, let's look at the story. Let's look at the core beliefs that got implanted here. Do you really believe them? Are they your core beliefs? The other thing that I really try to share often is that shame and trauma are inherited. Sometimes they're not even ours. You touched on this earlier, and I, I didn't yeah. quite get, get that in there, that you know, we all have amounts of it, but mm -hmm. some people inherit more, and some people are taught it more in their family of origins. And, and our inner critic, we all have that. It's huge. It's like, what if we created the inner advocate? Yeah. What is it to comfort yourself, yeah. to encourage yourself, mm -hmm. to be your own cheerleader, to be like, oh, I'm okay, I'm okay. Yeah, I didn't, that failed, that whatever I just tried didn't work. And that feels terrible. But I am still a good person. Yeah. I am worthy. Well, and it's the feeling piece too that's so important, like you were saying, the sensory aspect of it. Because I always say to people, you know, um, if you just write down, I am worthy of love and belonging, and that's an affirmation in your head, yeah. it's not going to work. You and I wouldn't have jobs if it was that easy. You know, I'd be like, oh, I'm worthy of love. So never mind. Forget the old for the old idea that I wasn't, you know, and then there's a lot of shame oftentimes in, in therapy too with people who feel like they're not. They're not able to overcome it quick enough. We live in this quick world, like we have to be able to get it and fix it. And I think that was such an interesting point about the physical hygiene, because I noticed that we we focus so much on the physical, even physical illness. You know, if we break a bone or if we have a heart problem or, you know, cancer, we can talk about that and get the support we need. Right. But if we're depressed or anxious or we're, we've got a PTSD response, there's so much shame around that, that it keeps people from stepping into 
this emotional hygiene that you're talking about, which I love that. I love that idea. And I think the thing about emotions versus our physical self is it's a little bit harder to, to, to quantify because like with physical illness, you can go get blood work, you can get x-rays, you know, you can have some time frames on how long it takes a certain illness to heal or what the treatments are. But with mental health, it's much more um, subjective. Is that the word? I would um, say personal. It's much more personal. And it's harder to kind of, and people want linear, people want that left brain linear, quantifiable ABCs, one, two, threes. And, you know, that's why writing my book was so hard because I, I was trying to put right brain therapy into some sort of linear format. That's and what I think you did. I think you did that. And I it, think that's amazing. It was tricky. It was really, really, really hard because I feel like it's more about allowing ourselves to uh, be with what shows up and work with the sensory experience. Of, and I think this is a good segue into the box. What do you think? Yeah, let's do Unless it. <laughs> there's something else you want to say about that before I open my box. So this is a 12 month um, program. Everyone who orders the box starts with box one. That is box seven. It runs through the spectrum. So you start with magenta and then you go to red, orange, yellow, oh. orange, yellow, green, and this is dark green. Okay. So this is um, on the, that's box seven. So in that, in the program, I do what I, what is very common therapy practice. The first part is about information and psychoeducation and, and working with the crisis at hand and how do you, you know, come back to regulating yourself when you're deregulated and some tools and skills around that. And then the second um, part of the, program, which is box four through six, is more about, okay, now how do I really come to know myself and accept myself and care for myself? And then eight through, or um, seven through nine is about um, releasing and really trying to work with some of the blocks that we have and, um, and embracing. So what do we want? What are we claiming for ourselves? And, and really defining that. And then the last three boxes are about self-actualization and transcendence. So it's kind of what we do in therapy. And it takes, you know, that can take six months with a person. It can take 10 years. Um, and in each box, I include something for all five senses. So I really try to get us down into our body awareness and our senses. So there's T. There's essential oil. There's something that makes sound. There's the tactile experience of opening the box. There's the visual of each box is a color. And so the color theme runs through everything in the box. Mm -hmm. So when you get the red box, everything's red. When you get the dark green box, everything's dark green. And it's created to, to really um, allow a sensual experience. And then there's some, there's one card of information. There's two cards of practices, which are, how do you apply this information to mental, emotional, spiritual, physical relationship and service, the areas of our lives of being a human being. Um, and there's journal pages and journal prompts and yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna open mine, everybody can see, but, um, and this is green, is, would that mean a heart chakra? That's green? Yes. Okay. So both of them, they're loosely based on the chakras. I mentioned the chakras here and there. It's not a big teaching in the boxes, but it's a, a reference point. Yeah. And I try to reference Brene's, Brene Brown is mentioned in there and, you know, various teachers, various ideas. So if people get sparked by something in a particular box that feels relevant to them, then they have some information to keep going with it if they want to. So it's a 12 month subscription program. Is that what right. it is? People yeah. get a box every month. Right. Yeah. Super cool. Super, super cool. And so um, hopefully I, your website should be somewhere in the post. Hopefully, if not, we'll, maybe you can even just type it in to in the send box so people know how to get in touch with you and get their box. I don't even know how to see that. I see public but I don't see a place where I can actually type. 
at the very bottom where it says send. Do you have that? You don't I just have, have that? a gray box. I don't even have a send button, but uh, maybe, okay. you know, well, it's Val. Is it Val Valentine Studios? We'll get it. We'll get it. Okay. We'll get it out. So this anyway. box is actually offered on Crate Joy. So Crate Joy is a platform that sells subscription boxes. And on Crate Joy site, if you search for emotional well being, then you'll find my box. So here we go. <laughs> I'm having a hard time with the right left camera thing. I'm already dyslexic. So to add that. <laughs> I know I was doing that too. <laughs> So here's what it looks like when you open it up. Isn't that just beautiful, just like that? I mean, oh my gosh. So then we have the little instructions. That's join the, the social media card. So that tells about where we're located on social media. And also I do one Zoom meeting a month for subscribers. So when you get the box, if you want some, if you have questions or you want to talk about, you know, anything in the box or even anything you're going through, um, once a month, I have a um, a Zoom meeting, an hour and a half Zoom meeting for subscribers. Okay, so so open it up. <laughs> I know. I'm like, I was trying to 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 see where the links are to find you. <laughs> so it says, "Thank you." Mm -hmm. We're glad you're here. <laughs> All right, so here we go. Yay! It's like Christmas. <laughs> So, oh, the heart, yeah. So it's telling me this is the journal pages that go in my, my that's, journal. That's actually the welcome packet. So on the welcome packet is the first thing that you pull out of your box, and it has on the front page everything that's in the box. So that lists, and each box has some things that are the same for each box, like every box has an essential oil and every box has a tea. But then every box is different. So each box has a different thing that makes a sound. Each box has a different um, extra thing. So they're all listed there at the beginning. Then the second card in that packet is the information card. You can see on the bottom of the cards they're identified. And that's just a little bit uh, an idea about what it is to allow yourself to release some of what is weighing you down and, and why that's good for us. And then the next two cards are the practice cards. So then the information is translated into actual practices for each part of being human. Nice. So I see Eileen has joined us now. Eileen and I think Deb too has been in my workshops where we actually make what I call paradox boxes. So it's kind yes. of a similar idea. We create, yeah, that's in my book too. Yes. It's a great, I love this exercise where we put things, we, well, we, we, anyway, we cover the box with things that help us embrace paradox. So yes. I, love, that, I love that concept because it's so confusing for people. It's like, how can you hold two things that are opposite to be true at the same time? Right. And so embracing paradox, but also the box is like a container you know, a way to hold things. And so I love this because we're holding our hearts in this green experience. And look at this. Tell you, I'm just going to pull stuff out and you can tell people. Yeah. I so love in this box is some sage. Um, and so I included a feather if you want to. I also just created yesterday the video for how to do that with reverence and to understand that this comes from a deep, um, spiritual tradition of North America and that sage is a sacred plant that is um, utilized to release and to let go and to clear the space and to cleanse ourselves and how to use that. Mm -hmm. yeah, beautiful. So we would burn the sage and, and, and then yeah. the feather. Oh, love direct, it. Direct the smoke to you. Yeah. And then this tea, dragonfly tea house. Is this in Santa Fe? Yeah. Yeah. Like Santa Fe. And so she, I gave her um, when I started, like these are the 12 themes of the boxes. And I um, asked her to create what she felt like the best tea to support the theme of the box would be. Oh, and okay. So, um, and then it has a little bit Put it in. You have three three um, cups of tea there. It's beautiful. Okay. This is like Christmas. We started out with chocolate, but then I got a little pushback from eating disorders and 
and try so I changed it to tea. <laughs> a little healthier. Yeah. So I'm opening. Oh my gosh. So shake it. Can everybody hear that? My it's very subtle, but that's the sound for this box is a heart rattle. And oh, with all the ceramics with each box has a piece of ceramic. And all the ceramics are made here in my studio at Valentine Studios. You make them? Uh huh. Well, I have. I did for the first year and a half. Now I have someone making the ceramics for me. <laughs> it got a little much to be doing everything else and every piece of ceramic that went into the boxes. What? You can't do it all? Why? <laughs> um, it's beautiful. It People can see it. Again, I'm having a hard time with finding my microphone. I mean, my, my microphone, my uh, camera. Um, but it's carved. The green, is, it, it, it carved and then painted. And then there's something inside that. Yeah. There's ceramics, little ceramic balls. Yeah. Wow. When they fire, they get hard enough to make a really, it's a gentle sound, but it's, a, it's the sound element for this box. Oh, it's the sound. Oh, yeah. Tell us. So this is sound. Mm -hmm. This is taste. Taste, and that really um, is extra. So that's extra. Very much about smell, and um, you know the fragrance and the cleansing. That pin is about letting it go. It's kind of light. So read on the side of it. It says, "Oh, I release and let go." <laughs> so writing to let go uh, yeah. to write as Brene Brown calls it your shitty first draft <laughs> yeah <laughs> right let it go that's yeah. awesome let go let go so in every box there's something to write with because in every box there are journal pages and journal prompts yeah. most of them aren't as goofy as that one but I had a little fun. <laughs> See if I can find the journal pages to go with the pen. I'm guessing. Oh, beautiful. So that is, um, I brought this because I knew you'd be opening it. Each box has a to do kit also. So this to do kit for box seven is to write down what you want to get rid of and send it to me. And oh. so there are three self addressed postcards and people write down anything that they want to release from their lives from themselves can be an experience can be whatever and mail it to me and i hold them on my altar and then once a month i burn them and i offer them up to healing and this i was inspired to do this by um a man who does a ha, had started this his name is uh, let me see. I'm not good with details. Uh, Frank Warren and his project was the Post Secret Project. And you can look him up and he's done this for years where people have written postcards of what they grieve and what they um, have lost. Uh, and he's done all kinds of really beautiful projects with them. He was featured on Sunday morning one time. And so I just started my own little small version of that. Beautiful. Lovely. Okay. And I'm guessing this is scent. Yes. That's the essential oil. So oh, each one of them's different. So you have a lemongrass. No, nope. I'm going to smell it right now. Yes. Love lemongrass. <laughs> smell it for all of us. <laughs> this is a powerful cleanser of personal energy. It assists letting go of old, man. This is good. And plus we're on the new moon last night. And it's a good time for letting go and starting. Yeah. Oh God. I'm, so I was, rub it in your hand, Patty, and then rub your hands together. And then cup it over your nose. Oh, that's lovely. Thank you. The letting one thing go. I know about smell is that it can change our state instantly. So if you are in a state that is deregulated, to use the essential oils to bring yourself back to yourself, and it, it can um, be this effective. Like, yeah, it's such a great sensory um, experience. So malachite, we have a stone. 
Every box has a stone, and each stone is different, has different qualities. I had the funniest experience when I was working for Creativity for Peace. It's an organization that brings girls from Israel and Palestine around the world to New Mexico, to neutral ground to create something different. And I had this um, camper, and we had a, a, a medicine woman come out, and she laid out her medicine with her stones. And this camper came up to me. She says, Val, wow, rocks have energy? <laughs> it was completely baffling to her. And, and I remember at a point in my life, like I had no respect for our earth and what the mm -hmm. stones do have energy and they do have different qualities and they have different um, histories. And Malachite is so wonderful, isn't it? Yeah, it's a powerful ally for those trapped in stagnation and defeatism. Its frequencies melt constrictive energies and stimulate the flow of the life force. That's good. It's so beautiful, too. Look at how pretty yeah. that is. It's hard to hold it and not respond to it in some yeah. way. Like it's yeah. really visually beautiful and really powerful. Yeah, I can, I can feel it. Transformation is happening. The stone of transformation. Okay, gosh, this box is like never ending. So we have a deep green candle. So every box has a candle kit where you make your own candle and remind yourself that you are the light of the world. That's so and light cool. it anytime that you need to connect with that knowing. So this is the counter to shame, right? It's like, I am made of light. I am made of stardust. I am valid. And to have a practice where when you really need to remember that, you just light a candle is very powerful. And can, or can be, if you know. So you and, roll it up? That's what the instructions so the, are. The wick is the heart. So you pull the heart, pull the wick off, and then you start on the end so that it, it ends up being like a little voltage candle. So don't roll it that way. So are there two or I, I just no, no, it's one candle, but you roll one layer and then you roll the second layer around it and it ends up being about that big. Oh, so you roll. Oh, that's so cool. I'm going to do this tonight. I did my little full moon ceremony. Wait, wait, wait. you're rolling without the wick in there. You got oh, the wick. In there. Yeah, on that's the very so end, right on in the, the middle. End. Okay. Good to know. See, I'm so glad you're giving us a tutorial. So I have videos on my YouTube channel and I have um, demonstrations of all of the to-do kits. I have a demonstration. It's not up yet of the candle making. I have meditations. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> That's awesome. I'm going to light my candle tonight. This is a great, I'm going to do all of this because this is all the new moon last night really got me motivated. And I went out and lit my fire and set my intention. So this will be great. Oh, so now we have these little, little beautiful cards. I'm releasing yeah. all that does not serve me. I treat myself with letting go of the need to control. That's a big one for me. <laughs> I love this concept of treatment. I treat myself with and call in what you need. I yeah. treat myself with courage. I treat myself with clarity. I treat myself with love that love you know i love that i always say give myself permission but treat myself is even better it's like whoa it's I, like I treat it's like it's like, like chocolate the <laughs> hygiene you're talking about it's better yeah. it's better than the ice cream the hagen dazs right right <laughs> better for my hips for sure <laughs> and this is i embrace the release of perfectionism Perfect. yes there we go oh it's so beautiful so i've got did I leave anything out? I think I got the it. The journal all. packet. Okay. The journal packet. You had it up at the same time when you had the. Um, this one. Yeah. Yeah. So it has blank pages and it has some specialty papers in there and it has journal prompts. So the prompts are on the back of that card. And all of them have the, the holes punched so that in box one you get um, rings. And you can put them all in as you get them each month. You put, you know, your pages and your prompts and your welcome packet, everything into your own book. Yeah, I love that. So pretty. I can't get it. Okay. 
It's a journal prompts. What is it that continues to weigh on my heart? Oh man, this is great, Val. I mean, I, you've, wow, what an incredible opportunity for people to have all these sensory experiences come to them as a gift. I'm gonna, right now, because this is so important, putting in my little chat box, get your box at, what is the website? I'm gonna type it in. Let me, um, www. Just one second, let me. Because I don't have, I mean, you can get to it on my website, which is ValerieValentineStudios.com. But you can also get to it directly on Crate Joy, and it's emotional-well-being-box at Crate Joy, or dot Crate Joy, actually. Okay, that was a lot. So I yeah. put, did I spell it right, ValerieValentineStudios.com? Patty, I'm sorry, but I can't see any of that. I don't know if I have something turned off on my end or whatever. I can't see the chat. The chat. The chat's on the um, right hand side yeah. of my. And then I can see. So, v a l e r i e v a l e n t i n e studios.com. Yes. Okay. Perfect. And then yeah. they go to the products page. Go to the products yeah. page. Okay. And right on there. that site, you can find my bio and you can find, you know, my clinical stuff. And but on the products page, you'll find the um, the boxes. So this was so fun to open with you. I, I, I told Val I was going to save it so we could do it together because I've opened um, one of the other ones so far. And it was just wow. I mean, all the sensory experiences again, are so important in healing shame. So thank you so much for what you're doing, Val, and for sharing it all with us today. Thank you. Um, is there anything else before we finish that you want people to know? Like what's your, what would be a takeaway that you'd like people to remember from? Well, I just, um, I just have such a resonance with your work, Patty. And I, I just really, um, appreciate what you've put into the book. I wish that you'd completed it before I completed my boxes because I would have liked to include some and I may do that in the future with your permission. Um, I am working on two more subscriptions, shorter ones. I want to do a three month subscription for um, life transitions and I want to do a six month subscription for the treatment of grief and loss. Mm. Um, I feel like, you know, we recognize in our field that trauma drives addiction, it drives personality disorders, it drives chaos in our relationships, it drives everything. So then we all became trauma informed. But what I believe is that underneath trauma is shame. Mm -hmm. And what underneath shame is grief and loss. Oh, and we have to be aware of how those are interacting with each other and um, and help people pull that apart so that yeah. it doesn't all get lumped into, oh, well, you're just anxious. Yeah. Well, you're anxious for reasons and or you're depressed. Well, grief and loss is so close to depression. Like it, it, mm -hmm. it, it presents the same way. Right. It has a lot of the same kind of symptoms. And so to say I'm depressed, well, why? What's happening? What's the depression telling you? What's it about? And and then often we get down to grief and loss. And we get down, I am hurt. I've lost something. And, and honoring that. Do you have a copy of my book, Letters to Freedom? If not, I will send it to you. Okay. No, I've read it. Yeah. Because I put a chapter in there called All Depression is Unresolved Grief, because that's what one of my teachers early on in my first master's program, first graduate program wrote. And I love what you just said. And grief and shame are really good friends, I think, because what I think of shame is the grief is the loss of our authentic self. You know, when Winnicott talked about true self, false self, right. um, and how we, we kind of lose a connection with our true self, our essence, our authenticity, because we try and do what all the big people want us to do right. and be. And shame, again, is a much subtler way that that develops more implicit than a trauma, but they all definitely are so intertwined. So I'm so yeah. glad you did that. 
So I'm actually going to do, so the shameless Facebook Friday series goes for six weeks. This is our second week. Um, so through October, I'll be interviewing four other amazing people. And then I'm going to do a grief series in November oh. and December um, called, I think, Grief and Grace in the Holidays. Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah. Oh, it's wonderful. It's so relevant. So I do I appreciate you saying that because I think and we're all in a collective grief right now, too, in this Absolutely. pandemic. Absolutely. That's the other thing that you, you, you triggered in me that I didn't get to say at some point was, you know, what we're feeling is collective. We're feeling a collective mm -hmm. fear. We're feeling a collective grief and loss. We're feeling this collective um, unknowing, like we're having to tolerate not knowing. We're having to tolerate showing up every day and not understanding where we're going. We don't know. How is this going to end? What's going to end? What's going to be transformed? What are we going to look like when we come out of a way of really taking care of ourselves that we didn't have before? I mean, this is about taking care of ourselves and each other. How deep do we want to go with that? Do you want to go with just re reclusing into your house so that you're safe from a bug? Or do you want to go and look inside and say, what has been out of alignment in my life? What is not working? Why am I anxious all the time? Why don't I ever feel like I have enough time with my family? How do I correct that? How do I really take care of myself? Well, and that would be a result. It would be like, ah, oh, then we're really starting with ourselves and walking out to greet each other with, with a depth and a strength that we haven't had. Mm -hmm. like we're still I love the idea of emotional hygiene. I've never heard that before. Well, I probably have. I've heard of sleep hygiene. and But anyway, putting it all together with, you know, really good self-care. And self-care isn't overindulging and eating all the chocolate mm -hmm. and going to the best spas. Self-care is very subtle, like we saw today. Just a little, you know, connecting to a sensory experience of something that is healing and feels good. Um is our emotional hygiene. So I appreciate that. And Eileen says, thank you, Val and Patty, a wonderful hour, collective emotions in society. Oh, yes. Thank you, Eileen, for being with us. Thanks, Deb and Tara. And um, and thank you, Val. It was delightful. And I love what you're doing. And hopefully we can stay connected and maybe, you know, our I our love that. I think our work definitely is parallel and I just really appreciate what you're doing. And thank you for having me on the show. What a you're, joy. You're welcome. And I appreciate what you're doing too. So, all right, we'll say goodbye for now. And um, so Val, valentinestudios.com. Um, yeah. Emotional well-being box. Emotional well-being box. All right. Show. Okay, I'm going to see if I can stop this streaming and say goodbye for now. And um, yeah, join me Thank next week. You. <laughs> you too. You too. I'll see you all next week with our um, guest, who's Katie O'Keefe, who's a trauma informed therapist here in um, Denver. Aw, Deb, you're welcome. All right. Bye bye. Bye. <laughs>